Hey there, I'm Tim Burnett, and this is the Solo Hunter Podcast. I'm all about hunting good, eating good, self-sufficiency, and downright rugged individualism. We're talking hunting and adventure, business and life with other self-sufficient and like-minded individuals. This is podcast episode number 12, Bighorn Sheep, Wild Horse Issues, and Habitat Management. Shh, take that out. <laughs> okay, I won't put that in. in. Southern Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> Remy lives in Utah, turns out. Yep. <laughs> right on the Wasatch Front, it's beautiful here. Heat expands, cold contracts. Hey, other thing, I know what shrinks in the cold, and it doesn't make sense. He's the backup packer. He's yeah. the guy that says even a solo hunter makes a good team packer. <laughs> <laughs> He's a funny guy. There's man. Mike right yeah. there. Yeah. Another thing that really affects wild sheep is the fact that invasive species take over their water sources. By invasive species, I mean the wild horse. If we looked out this window right now, you could probably count dozens of wild horses in areas where they shouldn't be. If you were just to leave everything to its own devices, I believe that the native animals would be wiped off without hunting. If you have 100 sheep in an area that can support 87 sheep, how many sheep will survive? Okay, we should, we should start the podcast there. <laughs> So we're sitting here with Remy once again, or still, depending on how you want to look at it, and just got back into town. You said that you, um, we talked about your hunts in Montana a little bit, so now we kind of want to go over and talk about um, the bighorn sheep hunt that you just did. You, you just did one, what, yesterday, yeah, my, two days uh, ago? Yeah, my buddy had a tag, Yeah. Um, so we did that last week. But, uh, well, I kind of just wanted to talk about sheep hunting because... Uh, I know that you had a sheep tag of sorts, Yep, a desert sheep tag of sorts. Which I'm not exactly sure how I got it because I can't remember what I did when I put in. Like, you applied weird. the wrong way, I think. What yeah, happened? I pretty much screwed myself this year is what it sounded like. Yeah, so because you drew a U tag, a desert yeah, U tag, correct? correct? Yep. Yeah, and my buddy Mike drew a desert ram tag, which was an awesome really? hunt. Yes. And so I went on that hunt with him. I, he did all the work. I just showed up, took some video and pictures, and cool. Um, it was it was cool. It was really fun. It was a really fun trip. Really cool experience. Had he ever drawn a sheep tag? Before? No, this that was his really first really sheep really tag. Um, if you guys don't know who Mike is, go back and watch season five or six, Remy's Nevada Elk Hunt. Yeah. The very end of it. Mike is... He's the backup packer. He's yeah. the guy that says, even a solo hunter makes a good team packer. <laughs> <laughs> he's a funny guy. There's man. Mike right yeah. there. Yeah, Mike is always down to just... He's the kind of guy, if you were at the top of a mountain 10 hours from home, and you yeah. call him, they're like, Mike, I need help packing this elk. He's like, I'll be in the truck. I'll be there in the morning. <laughs> I'm just glad that the first time that I met Mike, I was late to one of your parties, and... uh I'm glad I was late because I caught him at a very, very good time oh, to yeah. catch the full mic. Oh, you yeah. Know, like he was just all of what he is, it was awesome. Telling some stories. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no, Mike's a good guy. We should, we'll have to get him on one time. He's got some really Heck good yeah. stories. He's funny, uh, way funnier than I am. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, so it was fun because it was his hunt. He, from the day he learned that he had a tag until – the time he pulled the trigger, I think he scouted every single weekend from really? July on. Yeah, he was. He had trail cameras out. He was out there scouting. He, I mean, he put in. That's cool. He put in his time. He yeah. he got. He deserved the ram he got. Was sure. his was that his goal was to find the biggest ram in the unit and kill mm -hmm. the biggest ram or what was his well goal? that was a bike. I would consider that a bycatch of his goal. He wanted a, a Nevada book ram, so one sixty three or better. Which is a, a big desert. That's a big sheep. Yeah, and, and, and he was in an area where there isn't typically really big rams. Mm -hmm. But he ended up getting a Boone and Crockett ram, nice. which is cool. Like, that's – he worked really so hard. So over 163. Uh, yeah, it ended up – it it grossed with our, uh, you know, pre-score, whatever. It grossed 170, wow. netted over 169. Good for so 168 is all time. Good so I him. doubt it will shrink more than that, but you never – you know, shouldn't. Right. shouldn't. He's got it in the freezer, uh, right? No, <laughs> I actually, I mean, people always say that, put it in the, like, that's, that's the, it just was, what I heard. Put yeah, a but, stick, put a stick between it and put it in the freezer. That's all, okay. That, that makes no sense <laughs> because 
Heat expands, cold contracts. Hey, other thing, I know what shrinks think, in the cold, right. and it doesn't. They're mix thinking in. that it. Uh, but what people don't realize is, for if you're into the scoring thing, and Boone and Crockett, if you put it in the freezer, your 60 day drying period starts the day it re- is removed from the freezer. Oh, really? Yeah. So you can't put it in the freezer and then 60 days later. I mean, that's. Who cares? Like, why would you even? Yeah. Does it really matter that much that you got to put it in the freezer because it needs to be three inches bigger and then lie? I mean, it's ridiculous. I've heard people swear that a deer that they shot after it dried, it like cupped. You know, it just oh, like yeah. just totally. I mean, that can happen. Lost sure. inches, you know, especially velvet velvet deer. Yeah. Um, definitely. I mean, they shrink a lot because right. they're full of blood and all that blood dries out. Right. And some of them, it depends how early in the season, you know, the antlers will shrink. But, I mean, yeah. It doesn't score. Who cares, you know? But right. I, I, So, he I, shot a good sheep. Yeah, he shot a good, great sheep. Um, yeah, really good sheep. So, did he know he was going to kill it that day? Is that why he invited you? Or you, it was just like, hey, Remy's in town. I'm going out. Let's go. Well, no. It was opening day. And I intentionally didn't guide that week of the season to be on his sheep hunt. Oh, awesome. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I made time, uh, you know. And I, and the other thing was I was hoping to hunt my mule deer late, and then he drew that tag. So then I thought, well, I'm going to just, yeah, help Mike with his sheep hunt because cool. that's like a once-in-a-lifetime. And not really once-in-a-lifetime, but it's a very rare yeah. opportunity. And it's a very rare opportunity, but it's a really cool opportunity. And in the state of Nevada, it the opportunity is afforded to us as a conservation is a byproduct of the conservation efforts through organizations like Nevada Bighorns Unlimited. I mean, if you looked at the turn of the century, sheep were nearly wiped out of the state. Now they're with the goal of having sheep on every mountain range. They're not there, but very close. It's just a really amazing success story. And that has happened through multiple avenues. Some of it being, well, obviously, through fundraising from hunters' dollars is where they get the money to do these projects. Then that money goes to biologists. It goes to habitat restoration as well as building guzzlers because um, in a lot of desert sheep country, come into play outside of sheep being removed from the landscape that negatively affect the sheep. So which would we, be... So we could go into you that. You list them. Yeah, okay, so... Wild sheep are a very fragile species. One of the main things that affects wild sheep, I would say the probably the most dangerous thing that affects wild sheep today would be a, a, a form of pneumonia. Mm-hmm. Now, this form of pneumonia is generally believed to be transferred or believed to be transferred from domesticated sheep and goats two wild sheep who have no immunity to it. Domestic sheep, completely immune, can live their life out with it. Wild sheep, it runs so rampant through, it can wipe out entire populations. So in the state of Nevada, we had a very thriving Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep population in the Ruby Mountains. Rubies and the East Humboldt. And the East Humboldt, yes. That population is gone. So when, when it wipes through, it can be in the soil for years. Uh, there's a lot of now aggressive approaches to stopping the transmission of this disease. The animals could be wiped out. You could repopulate the area. Now, whether infected domestics are still in there or it's from in the soil from infected domestics, yeah, I don't, don't know. know. I don't know. Um, but you could repopulate the area after it, the sheep being wiped out and then them getting it again. So it's very, very bad. So that affects wild sheep. Um, another thing that really affects wild sheep is the fact that invasive species take over their water sources. And by invasive species, I mean wild the wild horse. <laughs> it's it's actually really bad. Um, not only do they compete for the same food source, but wild horse are extremely aggressive and very territorial. I have actually been charged and attacked by mm-hmm. a wild horse. The 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 studs, they will, they're so territorial. If you, the word stud pile, I'm sure everyone's heard that term, yeah. but not very many people actually know what a stud should, pile is. I've got some video footage of a stud pile. Maybe uh, I'll throw one in here. So, so for those of you that don't is. know, a stud pile is 
where a wild horse male <clears throat> takes a dump. It's one of his marking, marking. posts. So yeah, there may be, be like a, several in a It'd be like a white tail rub, but right. he's saying this is my territory. And that pile can be <laughs> – I mean, I have seen some that are three feet, four feet high. Right. It is crazy. Yep. It's just like he builds a mound of horse poop saying anybody that crosses this line will be killed. And, and so when a wild sheep runs through a wild horse's territory, which are not native to this landscape and overrun and unmanaged, which I just don't get. It's, it, if it we looked crazy. out this window right now, you could probably count dozens, dozens of, wild of wild horses, horses in and, areas where they shouldn't be. And sometimes you'll see, okay, a deer walks through a herd of wild horses, not a problem. You go, oh, they get along. But that's not the case. Like when a wild horse goes into a water hole, all the other animals scatter most of the time. I've seen, I've seen in a unit just north of here, wild horses on the water and deer trying to come in and that stud – would keep chasing, chasing the deer them. away. And those horses stayed there most of the day. Those lay in Until it. they those. finally just sauntered off and those deer are just sitting up there, you know, waiting. And then those deer watered at like three o'clock in the afternoon because they had to have water. Oh yeah. But that was their only chance. And they watered really quickly and then got out. Well, know? the other thing is a, a wild horse is not, it's not built into the ecosystem. <clears throat> so desert dwelling animals like the desert sheep and mule deer, or whatever, the the water sources are very, very fragile. And if you break that water source, those animals, a lot of those animals don't have the ability like a horse might have to migrate or go different Mm -hmm. areas. Now, a wild horse doesn't have a lot of, because of their size and where they live, and they don't have a lot of predators that other animals, native animals might have. So a wild horse could use a water source in the mountains, destroy that water source by overusing it, over drinking, whatever. Then now that horse can walk out into the flats and drink out in a stream in the flats that might be five miles from a mountain Mm -hmm. in the open with no cover and live out there the rest of its life. A desert sheep and a mule deer cannot live out in that flat like that. They just can't. They are not suited to survive in that element. It's a sheep is made for the mountains, and that's where they live. So when the water dries up, instead of going out in the flats, they'll probably just die off. And so that's a major problem. Do they have any – I mean, you've obviously – in some of the conversations that you've had, are they working to try to remedy that problem? I mean, I've heard rumors and different things, but what's what's the solution or what's going on? I don't on? know what the solution is. I think the solution is for people to put pressure on politicians to get some of the wild horse rules changed. Now, because there's groups that fight tooth and nail for wild horses, what I would like to call feral horses. Um, they see them as some kind of symbol of the West, which, okay, a certain amount of horses is fine, but even the horses themselves are suffering. I have seen more emaciated, starving, dying animals than I ever care to see. Me as someone that doesn't think that that, I I just, I hate to see that. I hate to see animals. Like, I have wild horses. I see wild horses every day. And the ones that I see, I like to see. I can see them right now out the window. We're looking at wild horses right now. There's some down there. From my office. They're, (laughs) they're, They're surrounding. And I don't fence them out. I enjoy them around. But when they start getting to a point where they're dying of starvation, dehydration, killing off native species, then I have a problem. Like I would rather see fewer wild horses, but all in good shape than thousands of them that cost taxpayers millions of dollars in an emaciated condition. So they do do roundups of wild horses, but they come under such fire that it makes it hard for them to be adequately managed. And when they do round them up then they just get put into corrals and fed and and just live this like are there because weird life they I have this adoption program yeah but does anybody really adopt them anymore or? uh i mean some people do but a lot of the a lot of the why quote i keep calling wild like a lot of the feral horses um are bre- in, now inbred with domesticated horses that have been released I mean, the original horses are ones that the Spanish had left. And the whole point of that was to have horses. So the point, this is what I, I, now you're getting me in a topic that I just, it kind of, now it's, it's, we've gone from sheep to wild horses. 
But I feel like people I think the two across the country do not understand hand. the situation that we are in here because they just hear wild horses and we need to protect the wild. We do – okay, if you would like them on the landscape as a cultural species, that's fine. I don't care about that. But you need to figure out a, a program that they are adequately managed for the range. That's all I'm saying. I don't know what the answer is, but I just think that if they're going to round, if, if it's rounding them up, then let them round them up. If it's some kind of, you know, like government culling, then do that. I don't really know what the answer is, right. but I just believe that when they find a s answer that science based, let them do that answer. It's only going to help the horses that exist on the range. It's only going to help the native wildlife. And okay, yeah, maybe you, to sacrifice a few horses for whatever, however they do it, to have a healthier horse herd is fine. Right. Like, right. it's just, I, I don't know. I mean, if you really cared about wild horses, I think you would understand that. But I think a lot of people just see them as these, these beautiful animals that they don't want harmed. Well, if that's the case, then when they go to collect them because there's too many on the range, you need to open up your property and put them all there. Well, we all kind of have the tendency to pick our champions, you know, and certain groups have chosen that, that the horses are more important to them than the deer, or the wildlife that's around. Like, that's their champion. That's who they – that's what they want to protect. Um, right. It's just – it just so happens that <clears throat> the horses are not very good for desert-dwelling deer and, and sheep. Right. They're just not, you know. Well, and the, and the, the historical significance so – the if you're claiming – it's just a hypocritical argument that is being made for the wild horses because part of it is saying, well, I've read – I go on, like, horse advocate websites all the time just to see what their spiel is. <laughs> some, of it, some of their spiel is they're, they belong on the landscape because they are a reintroduced species, which is a crock. Like, that would be like – yes, there was a forest-dwelling horse in the Americas – during the Pleistocene. <laughs> That'd be like releasing African elephants and saying it's a reintroduction of the species. Yeah. Like no one would go for that. <clears throat> oh, we're reintroducing woolly mammoths because we have, that just doesn't, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't jive. So, or like releasing African lions and saying, or African cheetahs and saying, well, there was an American cheetah, so now we're going to have cheetahs here. Right. But the original, the horses here were released on the range. So when you needed horses, you didn't have to feed horses. You just went and rounded them up, caught them, broke the best ones, did whatever to the <laughs> to the leftovers, and then had horses. It was for supply. Mm -hmm. But now they want to regulate it where it's like not even – it's sort of for supply, but that the demand isn't there for the supply. So how does that – There is. is. That, we I don't can know. round them all up and no, – I won't say it. Yeah. Ship them to Canada and make some glue, but – or something. I mean, I don't. I don't really know what. I'm not going to say what they should do with them. But they need whatever they decide. Whatever management tools are effective at managing right. the numbers is what I care about. So whatever that that tool is, if it's you know, if somebody opens up another wild horse sanctuary and they want to take the wild horses, that's great. Then take the wild horses and don't fight them rounding them up. But whatever it is, they need to be gone. A certain a certain percentage of them need to be gone. There can be some but they can't be overrun. Okay, so that was my rant on that. <laughs> well, I think I think sheep and horse go hand in hand. I really do. Yeah. I, especially in Nevada where it is such a problem. And, you know, if if there wasn't hunting to manage wildlife, wouldn't populations continue to grow, even though they wouldn't grow as rapidly as the horses because they have a lot more predator, natural predators than horses do. Horses have – there might be some mountain lion kills on some – sick or young yep. horses but not nearly at the rate that they would be for deer or elk or antelope correct and that and that's the thing is they aren't a part of the ecosystem in a way that benefits a good homeostasis balance of the environment the native animals would we have severely altered the landscape like if you look outside it, it whatever after a fire it's a non-native species of grass. Like the desert, the high desert where a lot of these sheep and deer live is very fire prone. It goes through seasons of drought and seasons of overabundance of water. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is it, it, the, it's very dry, not a lot of rainfall. It's a, it's a high desert. So lightning strikes, it creates big fires. Big fires sweep through. 
well, then that should be regrowth of plants and other things that allow animals and everything to flourish with the fire. So it's just part of the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. But we've so severely altered the landscape just through things that we've done as humans, whether you're a hunter or non-hunter. When a fire wipes through an area in Nevada now, a non-native species of grass regrows faster than the native species, which is cheatgrass. Hmm. And that cheatgrass... Just naturally it does that? or Well, it was accidentally introduced yeah so it's an it's a it's a noxious plant that will never be gone so because of that this one plant that someone brought over that now overpopulates in the key time for regrowth that like certain animals need certain habitats when that fire wipes through now this grass that has very little significant nutrients it's com- or horse cover food, or basically. whatever yeah the horses can eat it right sort of but the other animals that browse like mule deer, that's not – they need they need sage. They need bitter brush. Bitter whatever. brush. They need a lot of other things. that This plant now outcompetes. Hmm. So now you're talking about this huge problem where if you were just to leave everything to its own devices, I believe that the native animals would be wiped off without hunting. I mean, it's because the populations would grow and then a drought or something would happen. And then water sources would be taken over by a feral species that is more adapted to bad conditions and some of these invasive plants. And the native animals would die off and then eventually everything would die off. It's it's animal apocalypse. So that's why there's conservation organizations reestablishing populations, improving habitat, um, hunters going out and managing population numbers. And there's a science behind it. And there's a reason that they need to be managed in a certain way. And that brings us to the U hunt, mm-hmm. which is semi controversial under the reason that if I am my whole life, I've dedicated to building guzzlers, donating money for wild sheep, going to banquets and raising fundraising or whatever. Uh, and a lot of people have and hoping to draw a ram tag. A lot of the animals that are in different areas have been from transplants. So the thought would be, well, why don't we capture those ewes? If we need, if the number, if the populations are getting too high, capture the ewes, transplant them to an area that doesn't have sheep, that's in desperate need of sheep, and then let those sheep continue, and then we have more sheep overall. The reason for that is that that disease that I was talking about earlier, the it's a type of pneumonia is in those populations of sheep. So if they transplant that, they could be transplanting the disease and spreading it to other populations where they have a rule that they can only transplant populations that don't have that. From a, from a healthy population. From a healthy population. Mm-hmm. Now it might be like, well, this hasn't had it in X amount of years, but now it has it. So the the, the thing is where I stand is I understand that and I always go with, science-based management so whether i like it or not if science-based management says we need to remove some of the use off the landscape which will actually overall help the the rams grow bigger because there's be more food selective breeding whatever's helping the ram populate like rams bigger rams more big rams um and decreasing the numbers because of all the external factors that are happening because when a population gets too high it's very susceptible to disease as well and the disease transmission rate spreads way faster so by lessening the numbers you're actually protecting the amount there and if you can't transplant them because of disease then the best way to manage the population would be through hunting so guys like tim who accidentally put in for the u tag before the ram tag draw a u tag and get to go on a u hunt I would wait until I drew my ram tag and then have bonus points and go on a ram and a you hunt when I'm not waiting for a ram tag. But that's just me. Lack of understand or lack of even thinking about it. Was, it, really. uh, it was it was this the first year you could do that, so it was yeah. kind of confusing. I didn't yeah. understand it. Yeah, I just assumed. I, it, to me, it looked like, hey, you can put in for both. You know, you can put in for yeah. just like you can put in for all three species of sheep in Nevada yeah. and elk and deer and antelope and whatever else. It's like, oh, great, they added another one to it. You know, but so that that's interesting. So. When an area gets overpopulated, wouldn't they normally capture those ewes and move them to a different area and some of the young rams and move them to an, an area that was 
Correct. So yeah. in an area like the one that I was hunting, is that probable that they couldn't tr- relocate those sheep? The only reason, well, from what I believe, now I could be wrong. Um, I, I think you're right. So yeah, what, continue on so and I'll tell you more. The reason that you were, they issued you tags in that area is because that population is ineligible for capture. Correct. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, when I was checking in my sheep, well, in the, when you draw the tag, they send you all the pre-literature stuff. Watch this video so you can tell the difference between a ewe and a young ram, which is good. I'm, I'm glad I watched it because, like somebody that didn't really pay close attention, at 300 yards, it'd be easy oh, yeah. to shoot a young ram. Oh, you know? I mean, yeah. I was I was like petrified that I was going to do something, Wrong. and to where it even made my hunt, I say hunt, my afternoon a lot more stretched out than what it should have been, but. When I was there, there was one, at least at least one, maybe two young rams that did have pneumonia that were coughing. And I, I didn't know for sure if they had pneumonia or if it was that, um, you know, you know how, how animals might be. They could have dust in their lungs or whatever. Yeah. But when I saw him the first time, he was coughing. And I'm like, crap, that sheep's got. So I filmed him, took some pictures and everything so that I could report it. And then farther on, there was another herd and another young ram coughing. And so I filmed him and everything. Um, so that's what makes me wonder if that specific area, and I don't know, I can't confirm that without sitting down with the biologist, which I'm hoping to be able to have that chance to do that. Um, because I was very conflicted in doing this hunt to begin with, you know? Um, but anyway, I saw those sheep. So that makes me think that that prob that herd probably was ineligible for transplant because it's in yeah. kind of a remote area as it is yeah you know? and that's and that's the thing is when those populations <laughs> get really big the the percentage that will die off is a lot greater as the it, in so a larger population has a larger percentage of disease transmission what montana did i would say i think i honestly think that the first um case where they tried this was in an area that I frequent often in Montana. I was hunting. This was probably, it was probably, I don't even know, maybe 2013. I don't know. I can't remember. I, 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 it was a while ago, but they, one day I saw a ram that had severe pneumonia Mm -hmm. and I called and reported it to biologists and then drove on and continued to elk hunt. When I had come back, the biologists had shot 15 sheep. You're kidding. No, and I think they ended up shooting with uh, government shooters like 91 sheep. Just to get rid of it now? To, get rid- f- yeah. to eliminate the potential of spreading exactly, or whatever. To eliminate. And, and people were freaking out. By them doing that, there used to be 14 tags in the unit. Generally, when pneumonia wiped through, they would kill. It would pretty much wipe out the herd. There would be no tags the following year. They were able to stop it by killing 100 sheep. Killing 100 sheep prevented the loss of 300 sheep. Right. And by preventing the loss of 300 sheep, they still had two tags available the following year. So it was very controversial. It was controversial, yet it was the most effective method that they have found to work. Hmm. Interesting. Because there is no vaccine, there is no cure, but they know that how easy it spreads, if they can eradicate the herd or majority of them, it's very unlikely it will continue to spread. So in Nevada, they took those same measures in, I think it was in the Double H Mountains. It was one of the bigger herds of California bighorn sheep. They found the disease, they eradicated the herd. Because they didn't want it to spread to neighboring mountain ranges. And as far as I know, it has protected the neighboring herds. Now, is there a herd reestablished on that range? I don't. Uh, this not, was two years ago. Last so year, probably so not. I'm not yeah. sure. Yeah. Huh, that's interesting. So Montana did something this last year or the year before that was controversial as well. They had a, didn't they have a specific area that they allowed hunters to go in and eradicate. Yeah, and that that's what I I don't know think much about that's pretty one. cool. So the Tendoy Mountains, they uh opened up so Montana has a few units that are general uh essentially unlimited permit sheep hunts. The Tendoy Mountains was not one of those hunts. It was a, a draw hunt, but the sheep got pneumonia and have 
never reestablished. They, they've put sheep back in the area, and then those sheep keep getting pneumonia. So what they said is we need to eradicate the whole, the whole lot of them. Instead of us going in there, why don't we just allow hunters to pick up tags over the counter? They can shoot a ram or a ewe and in the unit on an over-the-counter gen- like tag. So anybody can go sheep hunt. Now, some of the sheep you're shooting might be sick, might not be sick. Mm-hmm. Most of them aren't sick, but they need to completely eradicate the population. So they know about how many sheep are in there. And they say, let's let hunters do it. We'll make some money that can go into research for the tags and then giving hunters the opportunity instead of paying someone to go in there and kill these sheep. And then after a certain amount of time, this might've been the last year or whatever, then they'll go in and use a helicopter to take out the rest of them. And then they can wait a certain amount of time and then reestablish the herd now that they know that there's no, but they weren't in, with those sheep, they weren't in fear of those sheep moving to other areas. It's a pretty isolated range. Isolated, yeah, because yeah, they were – the problem with the ones in Nevada were was, okay, we put hunters in there. Hunter pressure pushes the sheep out of the unit, and then we have all this stuff explode. Right, right. But I think that that would be a – I think that that's a really cool way to manage the population using hunters, giving them an opportunity, because they're essentially the ones – that are funding it all. They're the ones, they're the reason that the sheep even made it to that range in the first place. So giving them the opportunity to be a part of the conservation and possibly then that animal can also be tested. uh, All the studies could be done still and the meat will get utilized as opposed to, I don't know what they do with it when the government does it. I'm not sure. Do you know how successful that hunt was or did you hear like what? Oh yeah. People, people got sheep. Um, I don't know exactly. A lot of people bought tags. Not that many people hunted. Very few shot sheep. But I think the people that, you know, put their time in, they got they got sheep. There wasn't a whole lot of big rams or anything taken. Right. But, um, you know, just the opportunity to be yeah, a part for of sure. that yeah. was, is a pretty cool opportunity. I remember I Boyd, Boyd told me about it. He's like, we got to go do this. I'm like, oh, uh, yeah, sounds like, a, sounds like pretty pretty rough to me. But Yeah, yeah and I, I know some people, I think a lot of people <clears> – <throat> didn't actually like bought the tag and didn't go or yeah. didn't really, you know, I don't know. I don't really know. How I wonder if they went up. in after the fact and, uh, and took the rest of the herd out, you know, later on, or if they're still well, in they the were, process of, I, I, they're of still in the process. I think that, I think they allowed two years of hunting so far. I don't know if now that that's over, I would think. Now there was another, there's another area in Montana that's, that's an over the counter sheep tag, but once, but it has a quota. So once a certain quota once, is yeah. met, then they close it down. Right. And that's to kind of give a, also another over the counter opportunity, right? Yep. And that's the only state in the lower 48 yeah. that you can over the counter, sh- not over the counter, but unlimited. I've heard that draw. those hunt, yeah. that hunt is just like as close to impossible as it gets. Um, yeah. I, you know, the sheep are kind of in a certain area. It's just hard to get to. Yeah. And, it's if you've got horse, you need horses, and it's very timbered, and then a lot of that unit, the sheep move in and out of the park. Sure. So, you know, like this year would have been a really tough year for it. I don't know if the quota got filled or not because maybe it did. Maybe it was better because the snow, like a lot of places where the s- the sheep were, there's a lot of snow, so that might have pushed them out. I haven't actually yeah, looked at I don't know the checkout summaries or any of that stuff this year. But me and Boyd look at that, or he he looks at it and tries to twist my arm but oh, i think a lot of that's wilderness area anyway so there you couldn't really yeah, film you, in there anyway you wouldn't be able to film it i absolutely love sheep hunting and maybe it's because it's such a rare experience but it's a cool experience now not every sheep hunt's really hard and some are really hard there's some where they just don't get hunted much the sheep end up coming down toward roads and it's not that tough of a hunt mm-hmm. and then there's other sheep hunts where you have to backpack in miles or my first desert hunt experience i drew the tag when i was a youngster and then i hunted pretty much every day of the season and didn't see a legal or a li- it didn't see a living animal until day 20 you're kidding no nah, wow. it was miserable and i ended up shooting the ram that i had an opportunity at it came in from a neighboring area you could probably hunt that area now though and there'd be more sheep now oh for yeah sure. oh it's probably a good yeah. unit now Exactly. Well, a lot of it, just all the water dried up and there's just dead sheep everywhere. Really? Yeah. And um, it's one of the sheep, the the good areas just fluctuate all the time. But 
certain areas will be good for a while, and then they get disease, and then they get knocked down, and mm. then another area comes on strong. But they're very, I, they're kind of populations in flux. But the goal is to have them in enough places where, if one population might be hurting in the moment, another population might be thriving. Sure. But and a lot of that is all based on really hunter contribution. It's a really cool success mm. story that is directly attributed to hunting. It, it made me think when I drew that tag, like I wasn't even going to go, you know, really? because it didn't, it didn't really make sense to me because on one hand we're trying to, we're trying to save the population and grow the population. And then on the other hand, it's like, here, go kill them, you know? And so it just, it always conflicted. You know, I didn't yeah. even go until the last afternoon really? on it. Yeah. Because it wasn't like I was going for the meat other than, Sheep meat's pretty good, you know, oh, yeah, and that's really the best good. liver and onions that I've ever had. But oh, yeah. um, I don't know. I just couldn't convince myself to go. And I woke up that morning and took my daughter to school at 9 o'clock, and I got home, and I was like, eh, I don't really feel like working today. So loaded up the truck and drove down there, you know. It was three-and-a-half-hour drive, and I got there early afternoon. It was like 2 or 3 o'clock, and the whole time I was thinking, I'll just hopefully I'll see some sheep and just film them yeah. with, with no intention to even killing one. And, uh, you know, drove up the road on my four wheeler and it's like, huh, there's something weird on the hill. So I stopped and looked and there was a ram bedded there. And I, so I filmed him and dinked around and he went down to this flat and I was like, well, there's probably some sheep down there. When I ra- went around, there was a bunch of sheep there. And <clears throat> I mean, it took some, it took some convincing before I decided, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and shoot a sheep. But, um, the whole time I never really wanted, wanted to even hunt them because like from the tv show perspective or from the public perspective you're trying to convince people that you're hunting for certain reasons right or we're hunting for meat we're hunting for lifestyle you're hunting for sport whatever it might be you know and it's like how can i if i can't even convince myself of why i'm hunting a desert sheep you how can i convince the viewer of why i'm hunting a desert sheep you you know um so it was just it was just tough, it yeah. Was just tough mentally. And then when I finally shot the sheep and got up to it, I was I was like, like relieved because it was over. But I was also like in awe because of how amazing the the animals were, you know. Yeah. Um, just very beautiful. Um, I don't know. I, I'm glad that I did it, but I still I still don't know that I'm okay with it you know what i mean yeah I get it's, you. it's weird like i don't even know how to describe it it's weird see for me i think it, it's cool it's a cool opportunity because you get the opportunity to hunt a species that might like you don't get a ram tag very often but you get to be around rams it's just like a ram hunt yeah. you just don't get to walk away with ram which a you has cool horns they're i mean people hunt mountain goats that have smaller horns right right and are all yeah. excited about it and <clears throat> I mean, desert sheep are probably some of the best tasting animals out there. There is no question. I mean, yeah, that it, meat is phenomenal. It's an, yeah, it's like awesome. my kids ate it. My wife even sampled yeah. it a little bit. Like yeah. that—that that was probably what put it over the edge. Was it's like, this is a pretty easy meal. You know? Yeah. I mean, I can get this down and in the cooler and back home by midnight. You yeah. know. So that really kind of put it over the top. And now I'm now I'm sitting here trying to wrap my mind around how I can tell the story, the conservation yeah. story, because I've really never immersed myself into the educational side behind con- the conservation of the sheep and the, the reintroduction of the sheep and the management of the sheep here in Nevada. I just haven't, you know, not yeah. like yourself where you've really kind of aligned with the NBU and, and know people within the organization that, you know, that information is there. I just have never, never delved in and studied it. So, um, it's going to be a learning process for me as well, which I'm kind of excited about, you know, hoping to be able to sit down with the, with the biologist. And then, um, you know, I'd love to interview Gray Thornton. I've talked with him a little bit in the past with different things uh, with the head of the wild sheep foundation. And just to kind of see how those two work together, whether they do or whether they don't, but just to get a little bit more understanding of sheep in general within the state of Nevada and in the West, you know? So, yeah, I, I think that, I mean, the thing comes back to carrying capacity and I think that that's what a lot of the biologists are are very concerned about is if you have 100 sheep in an area that can support 87 sheep how many sheep will survive zero 
zero survive. Yeah, and, and it's not just based on food. It's based on when what happens is if you have a, a, a population that has now exceeded its capacity because of various things. Now, the capacity 500 years ago could have been completely different for that mountain range because it didn't have invasive plant species. It didn't have invasive horses. It didn't have a lot of things, right? It didn't right. have disease transfer Drought, from fire might not domestic have burned sheep. Half of it. Right. right. So you have an area now that biologists can look and say, this is how much this area can sustain. And they go, okay, we have too many sheep here. If we issued all ram tags, it's not helping. Because hunters, they get, it might be one opportunity in their life to hunt a ram. Mm -hmm. They want to take a mature animal. And by hunters striving to take a mature animal, it actually helps that sheep population. Because most of the sheep that are getting shot are eight, nine years old, just coming out of the past their breeding past their capacity breeding or whatever. Yes, right? a lot of them. So because of that, you, you're actually taking out a certain number of sheep but a very small number that is good to take out of the population. Um, because that's why they, a lot of areas, not in Nevada anymore, but like Idaho or Montana might have certain areas where it has to be three quarter curl Ram. Mm -hmm. It's just so you take a Ram that is hopefully older as opposed to counting the rings and aging it. Like right. Alaska has full curl or eight over eight years old mm -hmm. because they want to take out a certain Ram, not any Ram. Um, where was it going? The same oh. thing with the ewes. They wanted us to target older, older more mature rams. And that, ewes. Right. right, because you could get a, ram, a ewe out of there that's 14 years old. Yeah, my ewe, they said, that by, he said they were thinking six to seven-ish, but yeah. she had never bagged up, which was an indication that, that she had never carried a, a lamb. Yeah. You know, in, in that many years, there's, what's that, five, four or five years of, of lamb bearing capacity right. that she ne she probably never did. It d didn't look like she had ever bagged. Well, the, so. the reason, one of the reasons that a sheep will not have a lamb is because they're malnourished. So an area that has too many, it's a, it's a very compounding issue. So an area that has a hundred sheep, if you, that carpet was a hundred, could hold a hundred sheep. And we have 120 sheep in there now, or we'll go with 187. So now we're, you know, we got 100 sheep, but it can only hold 87 sheep. So what's happening is the sheep are eating. They're doing their thing. They've only got so much water. They've only got – so now the resources are split, spread too thin. So the overall health of individual animals decreases. So now those animals go into the breeding season without – the when animals breed, it's – the rate of fecundancy is based upon their – a lot of times their body weight and their overall condition. So if they go into the breeding season, they're unable to carry a lamb. Somehow the lamb gets aborted, and then that's a, that's a dry ewe. And if that happens throughout the area, then it's a, a higher percent, a lower percentage of lambing, higher percentage of barren ewes. But those barren ewes keep living and keep spreading things thin. Mm -hmm. It's not to the point where they die yet. So now there's no new generations coming up, which affects the hunting and everything 10 years down the road. Now those animals are also at a weaker state and more animals per square mile. So they're closer. So when that disease comes in, some animals can fight the disease off naturally mm -hmm. if they're in good condition. Mm -hmm. But when they're overpopulated, the majority of those animals are under conditioned. So the disease wipes through and generally will kill off the entire herd. So by shooting a hundred sheep, say in an area like they did in Montana where X amount, are taken out, you actually save for the future a higher percentage of animals. Also, the theory is as there's fewer animals on the range, each animal is in better condition. The rams that are the prized tag to have will be bigger. Hmm. And it'll foster more competition between the more dominant rams, which contain traits that hunters like. Heavy antlers, because a heavy antler ram has more weight when he hits, when a Water ram fights, ram, yeah. they hit. The one that succumbs to the fight is not the one that breeds. So the heavier, bigger ant horned, I almost said antler, the heavier, bigger horned ram will breed. But if there's 100 ewes, everyone gets to breed. And the ones with really bad genetics breed. And then you have an area with poor genetics and a higher likelihood of disease 
and the future generations that happen to draw that one RAM tag that they might get in their life don't see anything big. Yeah. yeah. So you're helping Which, everyone. Even if you take the hunting the hunting equation out of it, it's still not good for the for the survival of the animals, you know, of the herd, yeah. for the benefit of the herd. Well, um, I think th- that's one thing is y- you can contribute that attribute that model to all species, elk, mule deer, white-tailed deer. But the sheep species is the one that you see the returns in so fast. So it's the only species I say that we have where you can you can adjust here and see immediate. It right. goes like this, up and down, up and down, up and down, where you want it to, to level out and be stable. So you can see over a short period of time because they are kind of isolated populations in these, like Nevada's built where it's a mountain we have more mountain ranges than any other state mm-hmm. because, and the sheep live in these isolated mountain ranges. So it'd be a mountain range, flat mountain range, flat. And a lot of the sheep, although they will travel back and forth between ranges might be isolated to this small range. Mm-hmm. And then some are isolated to this big range and you can see the changes in the dramatic effects of invasive species, the dramatic effects of invasive plants, the dramatic effects of drought, the dramatic effects of, this, that, and the other thing, disease, because they're so susceptible and very in flux that hunting and population management, like the the whole principle of it, of cons- hunting as conservation, can be seen with immediate results. Sure. It's like a, you know, whereas in deer populations for whitetails in the East Coast, they talk about that and they go, well, you would you might not ever see that those effects in your lifetime. Whereas a sheep, you could see it in a matter of years. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's fascinating. Glad to have had the opportunity to do it, but hopefully next time it's, I put in the right way and yeah. draw that Ram tag next time. Yeah. Oh yeah. Then I'll put in more than half a day hunt. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll probably go with you. I'll pull a Mikey me. on it and I'll scout every day of the season. Yeah. Like what other tags? I'm not hunting anything else this year. Just sheep. Well, on my solo California bighorn tag, not, California bighorn as the species, not the state. Right. Yeah. Um, Which uh, is not recognized really in the Pope and Young, Boone and Crockett, whatever. No, it's not. It's it's considered, a, it's a subspecies of a Rocky Mountain bighorn. So mm-hmm. it's not considered its own species yet. They do not grow the same size horns as uh, a Rocky Mountain. Close. Bighorn. Yeah. Some, of those, like some said, of those California sheep though, I mean, yeah. 190 plus inches, you know. Uh, yeah, big. very few of them. Yeah. Not Nevada. Which is probably a Rocky that has migrated. And yeah, exactly. In, the, in the, uh, that area. I mean, traditionally, uh, California bighorn has a larger body but smaller horns. Mm. I feel like some at some point during this podcast, I said the word antlers for you sheep. You did, but you yeah. clarified it kind of. Oh, so. okay. I might have said it before. I don't know why. I'm just – when I start rambling. I'll watch for yeah. it. When but um, I keep wanting to say it. I know. <laughs> don't tell me. I know. Okay. <laughs> The two go hand in hand. Yeah. Same thing. You call you call antlers horns all the time. We do, you know. Yeah. So it's he, like that's back and forth. But obviously, it yeah, it is. it's way different. Right. But um, the yeah, so the California bighorns don't have horns like the Rocky Mountains, but they've got big bodies. They, they're more of what I call an A-frame type look, heavy at the bases, die off real fast. Mm-hmm. Uh, on my sheep hunt. My goal was to, on my sheep hunt, my goal was to essentially what I call hunt before the season, use scouting time. So if I if I had 10 days to hunt, I did nine scouting and one hunting. Mm-hmm. I wanted to opening morning know exactly the ram that I was looking for and be able to, you know, make it happen. Is that the way to do it with sheep? Because is there, once other hunters get in and stuff? Um, is it, I mean, because most people that kill sheep are usually doing it on the first day, right? That I know of? Uh, a lot. I think that part of it is it's the fact that I want to know going into the hunt what ram I can expect and what I should be looking for. So because sheep if you aren't familiar like if you aren't familiar with looking at sheep they can be pretty hard to judge. And also when you see a ram you go that's a good ram. But do you go well is that a good ram for this area this year mm-hmm. or is that an average ram, I don't know. So then you pass that ram up, and then you, and then somebody else gets that ram, and you're like, well, oh, that's the biggest ram in the area now. Now I know. <laughs> so you kind of want to go and really 
take your time and figure right. out where the good Rams are, what you can expect. And then that way, when the opening day rolls around, you go, okay, I'm looking for this sheep. Yeah. Especially, I mean, when they're in these isolated areas, usually those units are pretty, not small, but like you can cover that country in nine days. You can cover that unit. Nine yeah. Days, mostly. Sort of. But there's, there's pockets and they get into places that they, they move around. A yeah. Bunch. They move around a bunch and it could be one of those deals where you scout it, you know, what's available. And then 15 days later, you don't ever see that Ram again. Can't find it. Yeah. And that yeah. happens a lot. I mean, the Ram that I ended up getting on my California hunt, I'd seen, I was planning on going in and then some guys rolled up that night and were like, oh no, we're hunting. It was like kind of a weird, <laughs> it was a weird deal, <laughs> but they were, cause I left it and I was like, okay, I'm just going to back out. And I was very unobtrusive. And then all of a sudden some guides and four wheelers and just chaos. Hmm. And I was like, oh, I was kind of bummed thinking, okay, that was the biggest Ram in the area. That's probably why they were there. That's why they were there, yeah. yeah. But then I thought, you know, as stressed out as I am about all that shit going on, it's like, <laughs> that ram's not going to deal with that. I was like, I'm going to go back in the middle of nowhere where the only other place that I'd seen that ram before, and I go there, and four, it's four miles away, and sure enough, that ram was there, there that was. day. Was there other sheep there? Because on the video, I just saw the one, just him. No, he's by himself. Yeah. In an isolated pocket. Really? But that all, oh, yeah. And just, and a long ways away from any roads, any anything. Yeah. And he was just tucked in there by himself, bedding and feeding completely away from everything else. There was another nice ram with him mm -hmm. the day before. And I think those other guys ended up getting that other ram. It was probably like the second or third best ram in the area. Mm -hmm. But that really big ram was a very long ways away from all that activity it might have been you know i bet you the way the crow flies it's probably six miles so he just he he There's was familiar with that spot more. that was obviously kind of a safety spot yeah. for him and i think he that just, commotion of people the day before the season freaking out and driving around and circling around he probably just thought yeah i bet you they put him to bed and he was probably like hmm, this looks fishy because <laughs> yeah. a lot of people say sheep don't move at night but they they do yeah not often but that that was a case where they did he did huh. i mean i'd seen him the morning before you know he might have even moved in midday sure i got i saw him the morning before and he, i definitely was not he was not aware that i was there hmm. and i slipped out i was the only person around and then you know, roll in there the next morning. I was camping miles away just to not even taint the area. Really? And sure enough, it's like people just, I think they figured with the amount of vehicles they had, they now owned that sheep in yeah. the area. Yeah. It was just made my head spin. And I thought, <laughs> this is not what I want. I do not want to get into a foot race. I do not. That just, that kind of stuff just stresses me out. It just bothers me. I back away. I hate that. Yeah. But that's typical hunting in a lot of different areas. It is. It can be. Yeah. Well, let's make a plan to get, get uh, Mike and Jason and those guys together and yeah, do a big cool. podcast. That'd yeah, be that'd awesome. Be cool. Sweet. Sounds thanks, good. Remy. Appreciate yep. it. Talk to you later. Hey, big thanks to you guys for tuning in to this episode of the podcast. We really appreciate your continued support that you've shown to Remy and I over the years. Your support does not go unnoticed. For more information on the Solo Hunter TV show, branded merchandise, and other great hunting gear that we make, head over to solohunter.com, that's solohntr.com, where you can check out photos and videos from the Solo Nation, and if you feel like it, purchase the All Access membership, where you get unlimited access to our complete digital video library of episodes and web-exclusive films. You also get an unlimited 20% discount on all purchases of Solo Hunter merchandise and automatic entry into amazing product and hunt giveaways. Again, we really appreciate you for being here, and I look forward to meeting with and talking with you again soon.